how many people know about uh, quantum physics? Yeah? Yeah? So I was looking at this, uh, I was looking oh, at this, wow. this, this, uh, this talk synopsis and I'm like, maybe this is going to be a good talk. Maybe not. Maybe it won't. <laughs> I guess I won't really know until I take a look at the talk. Yeah? Learned that from a baby book. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, let's have, give Andreas a big round of applause for coming all the way to Vegas from Sydney, Australia to talk to us about <laughs> quantum cryptography. Have a good time, man. Thank you so much. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, after that introduction, uh, hopefully you walk away and uh, learn something in this talk. So, um, quantum computing, if you read whatever is in the press, you either think we are completely doomed and, you know, the internet's going to end or uh, nothing's going to happen because they will never exist. So I thought I want to explore this topic a little bit more from an algorithmic point of view and really see where we are. Not so much on the hype but more really what are the algorithms uh, that we talk about right now. So um, I started various companies in the security space, you know, starting in 2002 which um, uh, makes me feel slightly old uh, right now. Um, but first I'm speaking at DEF CON, very happy about this, you know, long term attendee but never spoke here so let's get right into this. So when you talk about cryptography, we mainly, you know, look into two different um, uh, types of cryptography. One is a symmetric crypto system, which is a symmetric shared key. Uh, you know, kind of like AES, for example, both sides encrypt and talk to each other with the same key. And we have asymmetric uh, crypto systems, which use public uh, key infrastructure, where basically I use a public key to encrypt a message and a private key to uh, decrypt it. Um, there's various forms of this, uh, obviously for di digital signatures as well. And um, uh, in, in this realm, um, virtually every crypto system right now that is deployed uh, anywhere is what we call computationally secure. That is secure in the sense that there are known algorithms that can break them, but all of the algorithms that can break them are not easy to do in the sense that, you know, uh, if I want to break an, uh, you know, 2048 uh, RSA key with a normal computer takes me a couple trillion years, which means I'm secure even though there's known algorithms uh, that can break them. Uh, there are information theoretic algorithms out there, most notably an algorithm called um, a one time pet or Vernum ciphers, but they're really tricky and not really practically usable. For example, with one time pet, you do need to use the same amount of keys as you want to transmit. So if you want to transmit a one megabyte file, you need to have a one megabyte key. Basically for every byte you need a different, um, uh, uh, for every byte data you need a one byte key. So you would have to manage massive amount of uh, key material which is not really uh, practically. But I mean, they do exist. But outside of this, virtually every uh, crypto system is just uh, computationally secure. And um, uh, when you look at this uh, quantum realm, and I'm going to quite some detail about this, uh, for those two different types of algorithms, it is uh, much more interesting to look at the asymmetric part of the uh, of the crypto systems, because in the symmetric part there is a quantum algorithm as well called uh, Grover, which basically looks into um, a or provides a quadratic speed up to the classical um, uh, version. Basically in the classical world if I want to look for this shared key I need to basically brute force every different combination which obviously takes forever. Uh, I get a squared root up, uh, um, a squared speed up in the quantum version which is a fantastic speed up you know if I can speed up 150 trillion years it's you know a lot of years but it's still obviously 150 trillion years uh, to break it. So that's not really too interesting. So we want to focus here on the asymmetric part where um, uh, the uh, speed ups that quantum computers can provide are massive and uh, we want to go into quite some detail uh, why uh, their speed up is so big as it is and uh, how they work. So let's revisit just a little bit of how RSA encryption works and it's really just a basic uh, introduction so we can use them uh, to understand how the uh, quantum versions of these algorithms works. Basically I choose two prime numbers P and Q and um, uh, with those I, I just multiply them, get the number N. Now with the number n I can calculate this lambda n function which is a Carmichael function which is just the function I can easily calculate this. And once I have this I just choose another parameter e which is smaller than the uh, lambda n uh, uh, value and then this n together with the number e is my public key. I can give this to everybody out there who I want to choose to do um, uh, the isometric encryption. 
And I basically retain my private key, which is this uh, uh, number D here, which is just the modular inverse of the number E, which is uh, the, the public key. Obviously, mo mod lambda n is always mod lambda n kind of uh, in, in this uh, uh, scenario, which is the private key that I retain. And with this private key now, with this scenario, I can now look into hi, I can now encrypt something and send something um, from Alice to Bob. And as everybody knows, with isometric encryption, I can only encrypt something that is smaller than my key. So if I have a 2048 uh, bit key, I can only encrypt something that is smaller than uh, 2048. Um, so I need to pad my plain text into um, uh, a number n. So I turn this big M into a small number M. Um, uh, there's various ways for this. Ways for this. I don't go into too much detail, but this is where the padding scheme uh, comes in. And then I basically end up with this number uh, uh, small m. In my cipher text, my encrypted versions really, I just take uh, this number m to the power of e mod n, and that's basically my cipher text. And this is what I encrypt with the public key, and I can now send this uh, number c to uh, um, to Bob. Uh, or receive this, and if you have the private key, you can easily decrypt this as well on the other side. And uh, you can easily see how this works. It's, it's really very straightforward. If someone has the C and the ciphertext and the D, the private key, by definition C is M to the power of E. So you see, um, uh, but the definition of D was that is actually the inverse of E. So this E to the power of D just uh, equals out. So I end up with M mod N. So uh, if I have the private key, I can easily recover um, uh, the, uh, the small M. And obviously by just reversing the padding scheme, I have now my uh, my message again. So this is basically how RSA encryption works into some detail. So my task is now, I do have a public key because that's public, everybody knows what the pu public key is. How do I turn this into a private key? Now from the, uh, from the definitions, it's really pretty uh, straightforward and simple. Um, I need to find those prime numbers that make up this number n. The number n is known, it's part of the public key. And if I can do this, I can easily calculate lambda n, which is really just the uh, least common uh, multiplier of uh, lambda p and lambda q. And from that, I can easily derive the private key d, um, uh, and I'm done. So all I need to do to basically go from a public key to private key is to find those two prime factors p and q um, uh, that I chose in the very beginning when I set up my key um, uh, and then I have everything I need to do to basically derive a private key from a public key. Um, while that sounds pretty easy and straightforward, actually to do this and to factor this number n into the two prime parts p and q is, um, uh, is really, really hard and all of the classically known algorithms are all from exponential complexity which means they are really, really hard uh, to solve. Even, you know, the uh, GNFS uh, algorithm is uh, slightly sub-exponential but still massive in scale. So that gives you those assurance that if you have, if you use any of the asymmetric algorithms, uh, people would need trillions of years to decrypt them so they're fairly secure for generations to come. But in 1984, a guy called Peter Shaw, he was a um, theoretical physicist, came up with this algorithm if we were to use quantum computers, obviously in 1984 there was all just a theory, quantum computers didn't exist, and they hardly exist today, but, um, but the theory says he came up with an algorithm of how to factor those numbers in just polynomial time. And in just polynomial time really is a difference that is, r that is almost incomprehensible. Because it really means instead of taking a trillion years on a classic computer, with a trillion operations per second, let's suppose I have a quantum computer which just does a million operations per second. I can actually uh, do the same thing in just 10 seconds. So the difference between exponential complexity and polynomial complexity is just out of this world. And that obviously, if we could run this algorithm, would pose a big threat to uh, basically the whole um, uh, crypto systems as it, is, as it is deployed. Because the base of this, whether it is, um, you know, for RSA or elliptic curves or for digital signatures, ECDSA, which is used in Bitcoin, or for a key exchange like Diffie-Hellman, which is mainly used in 
everywhere you go uh, on SSL, TLS exchanges. So the base foundation of this is used virtually everywhere in today's internet. So that would be a big threat. So let's explore a little bit um, how Peter Shaw could came up with his algorithms, what is actually needed and how they work in, uh, in reality. So now we need to do a little bit of an introduction into quantum computing and uh, it gets only as deep as I thought we need to go to understand how Shaw's algorithm works and uh, what we need to understand. Um, uh, so hopefully it, it's, not, it's not too bad. So basically there are two big types of quantum com computers that we look at right now. One is called gate based quantum computers. That's a big chunk what everybody's working on. All the big guys, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, Alibaba, they're all working on gate based quantum computing which is called universal con quantum computing because I can solve virtually any problem similar to a classical computing uh, on this computer. There's in a different computer um, uh, called quantum annealers or adiabatic uh, quantum computing which is what's the first quantum computer that was available was uh, from D-Wave. And D-Wave's computer, this adiabatic quantum computer is not a general quantum computer. You cannot solve every problem on this quantum computer. It is very specialized to only solve a particular optimization problem. So it's very much um, you can look at this basically as a physical system and physical systems tend to always end up in the lowest energy state which we call the ground state of this physical system. So if I can now define a function that I want to solve and I basically define those functions in a way that the lowest energy state is basically the same as the solution to this optimization problem, I can use this physical system to solve the problem that I have because I know the physical system will end up in the lowest uh, uh, energy state in the ground state and I know then this also tend this also represents in the state where my optimization problem reached the lowest point. And there's a really cool um, uh, theorem um, which actually guarantees to me that I end up in the lowest state that there is. You can really think of this as kind of like mountains and valleys and you can end up in a valley that is just halfway through and you're not really in the lowest state. But there's a theorem, um, uh, we are going to explore this a little bit which guarantees, which gives me way how I can really be at the lowest state so I can solve or I can find the optimal solution to this optimization problem. But it's really just solving optimization problems. The gate based quantum computing uh, is really a general quantum, it's a general computing um, uh, architecture where you start with an input you apply all sorts of different calculations to it. Technically those are all gate based uh, calculations. You do an AND gate, you take two qubits, do something to it, you get a result. But essentially you have an input, you calculate something and you have an output and you basically uh, you can calculate every, uh, e everything you want to calculate uh, with these uh, universal quantum computers uh, while quantum computers like d can really only solve um, optimization problems. But actually as it turns out both approaches can be used to solve the factorization problem. And uh, we have Shaw's algorithm from 1994 which uh, um, uses gates to um, uh, solve this problem. And in quantum annealing we have various approaches since 2002 and I want to explore those a little bit in the uh, next couple of slides as well. How they work to actually um, uh, solve the factoring problem as an optimization problem. So let's dive a little bit into quantum computing and what I need to understand to, to explore a little bit Shaw's algorithm and really with the idea of giving you an understanding of how can someone derive an algorithm that gives me now such a dramatic improvement over a classical algorithm which takes uh, exponential time uh, uh, to solve. So the basic building blocks for uh, quantum computers are what we call qubits. Qubits is the equivalent of a classical bit. A classical bit is either 0 or 1. A qubit is now a, you can almost think of it as a quantum mechanical system which can be in any state you want it to be and you don't actually really know in what state it is. But once you measure this quantum mechanical system, it is either going to be 0 or 1. And this is, an, uh, this is something that we're going to exploit later on that while before we measure this system, we don't know in which state it is. But it can be actually in a superposition. It can be in a state where all of these um, uh, qubits can um, interact with each other. 
and only at the very end of my processing step I will measure the system and all of those superposition states will uh, basically terminate and I know it's either zero or one. But it's really a quantum mechanical system. You don't really know what it is. It's neither zero, it's neither one. It is something in between. Uh, quite often we then uh, assign um, uh, variables to it and here you can see a representation of one of those qubits. We have this uh, two bases, zero and one, which basically represent this uh, zero means if I measure this particular qubit in 100% of the cases I will get the, the measurement outcome of zero. The one means in 100% of the case of measurement it will give me the uh, measurement outcome of one. And now a qubit is in the superposition of those two with the uh, alpha and beta. Those are two complex numbers. I can represent those and uh, that can now define uh, the state of this particular qubit. Now we call alpha and beta probability amplitudes because if I measure this particular um, uh, qubit I will now get the probability of the measurement outcome for uh, to get the measurement outcome zero the probability is going to be alpha squared and the probability of getting the measurement outcome of one it's going to be beta squared. Remember when I measure this particular thing even though I have two complex numbers associated with it when I measure it it's going to be either zero or one with a certain probability associated with it and the probabilities are really defined by those two numbers uh, and basically to the squared um, uh, for alpha and beta uh, you know I know it's going to end up in zero and with those two numbers I can represent those qubits it's basically a mathematical representation of the quantum mechanical system uh, that the uh, quantum computers operate in. But remember all of these measurements and everything we do in the quantum world is probabilistic. Everything is just a probability. I can put a quantum in a state where I can tell you in exactly half of my measurement it's going to be zero and half of my measurement it's going to be one. Which is perfect for random numbers for example because I can tell you hey you don't really know whether it's zero or one. It's exactly equal probability of getting zero and one. So I just take one qubit, measure it five trillion times and I get five trillion uh, random bits. But obviously I don't really know whether I get zero or one. It's all defined by probabilities which has a big implication on the algorithms because the algorithms will also only give me probabilities. There's no algorithm that can give me I run through this algorithm once and it will give me the answer yes it is this answer. It will always only give me yeah I think with 83% uh, probability it's going to be this answer for example. So quite often you run these algorithms multiple times to really see um, uh, 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 where you end up with. The second um, uh, principle that we need for Shaw's algorithm is the concept of entanglement. And uh, that gets slightly philosophical. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on the mathematical part of this. Entanglement is basically a property where I can have two qubits and I know that there's some correlation between those two qubits. In a classical world I have two bits and the two bits are completely independent of each other. Neither of those, those bits will interact with the other. And if I, if this qubit, if this bit is one, doesn't matter what this is. In a quantum world I can have a, a, a relationship, a correlation between those, those two qubits. And a simple example is this Bell state of two qubits. So this state is here a state where you can say, where you have two qubits. In those funny notations the first zero is, a, is the value of the first qubit, the second zero is the value of the second qubit. But if I would measure this qubit here and let's suppose I measure the first qubit as being zero. It cannot be the second one because you know the first zero, the first qubit was zero. So it, the second qubit has to be zero as well. I know that the second qubit is going to be zero simply because I measure the first qubit and there's no way because I don't have zero ones or one zero in there that the second qubit could something different than zero. So I take basically two qubits, give them into this quantum mechanical system, prepare this bell state and now I have two qubits that are separate uh, from each other but in this quantum mechanical system those qubits are now correlated or what we call entangled and now I could give one qubit to Alice and send her to the moon and one qubit to Bob and send him to Mars and I know that if Alice looks at her qubit and Alice says oh I got a zero, I know Bob has a zero as well. Even though there is no communication between those simply because there is this correlation in those properties. Now I need obviously those two qubits. I need to prepare them together and then I can send them anywhere I want uh, and they are correlated 
without any communication in between those two. Um, there's lots of philosophical implications because I could give, I could put those two qubits light years away from each other and uh, did I really find a way of uh, communicating faster than light? Uh, no, I didn't because if Alice measures, it's going to be zero. If she wants to tell Bob, hey, I measured zero, she needs to communicate this information uh, to Bob, which obviously uh, she needs uh, a few light years uh, to do so. But it's an important principle that we're going to use in Shor's algorithm as well. And the main thing for you to understand is the um, exponential large size I can look into when dealing with those quantum systems. Let's suppose I take two classical bits. I can uh, represent four possible states with two classical bits. But only one of them at a the time. So, you know, if, uh, I mean, you see the four states there. My system with those two bits is in one of those states at any, one po at any point in time. In a quantum world, I can take two qubits and basically at the end when I measure this system, it's also going to be in one of those four states. But before I measure this system, the, because of superposition, those qubits can be in all four states at the same time. And only when I measure the system, the system will collapse to one of those uh, four states. And this is exactly now um, a situation we're going to exploit where if I have n qubits, I can represent two to the power of n states. While I do calculations, I still at the end of the day need to know what the result is of my uh, calculation. So I need to measure at some stage and then it will collapse obviously to um, uh, those n states. But during calculation, I have two to the power of n states, which is a massive amount of uh, um, uh, states that I can represent with just a few amount of, uh, of qubits. So now I, I now have everything kind of uh, to look into Shaw's algorithm and, uh, and how it works. Um, uh, and we're going to look into this. So the main idea for that Shaw had was actually if I want to look into how to factor uh, n into p and q into those pri two prime numbers, I don't actually need to solve that problem. That problem is equivalent to a different problem. And basically he looked into number sequences and he realized from number theory that you have a number sequence, for example, uh, you look at the number sequence here, um, you multiply the previous number by two. So if one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. If you now do, if you now use this number sequence and do this mod fifteen, for example, in, uh, in this example, you end up with a number sequence one, two, four, eight, one, two, four, eight, one, two, four, eight. This is what we call a periodic um, uh, sequence. So it's always going to be the same uh, kind of uh, sequence of one, two, four, eight. And we can now define a, um, uh, uh, a number which is called the period, which is four, which is basically the, n the number of the, the amount of numbers before it repeats itself. And um, uh, the underlying algorithm from Shaw is that if I want to find out the factors for this number n, if I want to find out this p and q, I can actually transform this into a problem of finding the period r. And that turns out for that problem, I can run it very easily on a quantum computer. So basically, um, uh, if I look into this and the cool thing is, and I want to show you this on the next slide, the mathematics behind it is actually fairly trivial. A basic level of linear algebra gives you everything to understand how this works. So the only thing you need to accept is that in, out of number theory, there's a theory which basically says this, num this function uh, f, f a, x to the power of a mod n, is a periodic function. Um, if x has uh, particular properties, and now I only need to find uh, the number, uh, the uh, period r. And with this, I have my algorithm Shaw, which we run through in quite some detail actually, but essentially it's comprised of three phases. First is I turn this factoring problem into a, a period finding problem, and that's actually trivial. Then I use a quantum computer to actually give me this period r to solve this period r on a classic computer is again really, really hard. Actually, in a classic computer, it's still of exponential um, uh, complexity, which means that this algorithm on a classic computer does not give me any advantage whatsoever, but I can use a quantum Fourier transform, and that gives me the speed up. And then basically, once I have the period, I can really very trivially um, uh, use this to find the factor. So stage one and, or step one and st step three are really trivial. Step two is where all the magic happens, and that's where the um, uh, that, that's where the main speed up uh, comes. Now I don't want to go into too much detail, but it's actually really simple, so I think you can uh, download the slides and you can look through this. I know that FA is periodic. 
I know that x to the power of zero is one. I mean, everything to the power of zero is one. And if r is now my period, I know because the function is periodic that x to the power of r mod n equals one two equals the same what it was before because it is period. And really with basic linear algebra I can now use the x to the power of r equals x to the uh, power of r half to the power of two and I can uh, um, uh, um, just write this in a different form which gives me this um, uh, uh, multiplication of two numbers that will give zero mod n. So if I can use this, if I have this r, I, ha I have these two numbers. So, but if those two numbers, um, uh, mod n, is an, uh, th those are an integer multiple of n because their product is zero mod n. So that means they're an integer multiple of n. So either those are directly factors, or if they're not directly factors, each one of those has a factor in common with the number I want to look at. So the greatest common divisor, which is actually um, not too hard to compute uh, classically, it's just an n squared complexity. So by computing the greatest common divisor for each of those numbers with n, I have my factors uh, for uh, uh, for n, and uh, that is really simple. But to get to this r is really really hard. But I can put this together in a really uh, quick example. Let's suppose I have n equals 15. Now everybody can calculate in the head that the prime numbers are 3 and 5. Basically I choose any integer between 1 and 15 and let's really use for the sake of simplicity, let's use x equals 2. So you can see my period here, mod 15, is 1, 2, 4, 8. Uh, so I have the period 4. I can see this. That's a really hard part to uh, calculate. But with the period 4, the greatest common divisor of x to the power of uh, uh, r half is r is 4, so r half is 2. Uh, x is 2, so that's 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. So the greatest common divisor of 3 and 15 and 5 and 15, so, so uh, 4 minus 1 and 4 plus 1 is obviously 3 and 5. And when you calculate this through, actually in every case you come up with uh, 3 and 5. So that's exactly what Shaw's algorithm is all about. But the really hard part is uh, figuring out uh, what is this period R. And this is kind of where the quantum, uh, uh, quantum algorithm comes in. And those quantum computers or those quantum algorithms always work in the same principle. You basically, you, you initialize basically the result that you want to see and say, let's think of, we want to get a 256 bit number or two, 2048 bit number. And you basically, every bit, every bit of this bit representation is going to be either zero or one. So you basically put this in an equal uh, superposition. So every bit you basically put at 50% zero and 50% one because you don't really know what it is. So it's really kind of like uh, at 50%. Then you run through this um, uh, quantum Fourier transform, which will use amplitude amplification. So with every iteration of this algorithm, those amplitudes will now go towards one or to zero, which is going to be the final result. And you run this through a, um, a number of times, and then you measure it at the end, and you will see when you end up with. I'm going to have an example of this uh, um, when we run this uh, through on a, on a real quantum computer. But just to um, uh, summarize, Shaw's algorithm altogether is uh, fairly simple. You choose any random number a, which is uh, smaller than n. You compute the greatest common divisor. If this is not one, actually you found a you found a fact and you're done. Uh, but that's uh, obviously not uh, most likely not the case. I use my quantum computer to find this period r. And once I have R, I just need to find the greatest common divisor of those uh, two, um, uh, two terms, and I'm done. So, um, uh, another example I choose randomly uh, number seven, calculate period R, e R equals four. I have this greatest common divisor of 48 and 15, and 50 and 15 gives me uh, three and five. So it all works fine. I can now use this and use a, um, a library, a toolkit called Kiskit which is an open source toolkit, there's now at least five or six different open source platforms how you can use quantum computers and how you can program quantum com computers um, either on quantum simulators or on real quantum hardware. And I gave you some references here, you can look up those, it's actually kind of fairly easy um, uh, to go through. But they all start the same. And here you see an example of this amplitude amplification. Basically in the end you see all of the possibilities what the, my prime numbers could be. 
They're all in the same probability what they could be. That's my starting point. And once I run through this algorithm and I ran through this uh, Shaw's algorithm on, from these references, the amplitude of the correct results have now been amplified and the amplitudes of the wrong results have now been kind of like gone down to zero. And I actually see that there's two results, r equals zero and r equals four. r equals zero is obviously trivial um, uh, um, uh, probability so I discard this and I end up with r equals four. So this was now executed on a quantum simulator. Quantum simulator I can simulate a quantum state on my normal computer. But remember qu in quantum computing we're exploiting this fact that I have this massive large space of two to the power of n. So I'm gonna have really trouble simulating more than whatever 100 qubits or so on a normal computer. And um uh, uh but for smaller ones uh, for illustration it's actually quite cool. So the cool thing is IBM has a quantum computer that you can publicly access. You can write a, a quantum computer program executed towards their cloud. It's very simple. You just change, hey, my backend is a simulator. You change the backend to uh, IBM's quantum computer. Um, and if you execute this against a real quantum computer, it's just a five qubit quantum computer um, uh, right now, I still get R equals four with the highest probability. But you see there's lots of other probabilities. And those probabilities are representative of all the errors you have in the system simply because those quantum computers that we have right now are really pretty bad. What they are what we call noisy. They don't produce r the correct results. Because they're noisy, they produce lots of wrong results. Now by re repeating my algorithm lots of times, I can still get around this fact. And obviously in this case, I still have R equals for the highest probability. But obviously that has big implication on performance because I need to now repeat these um, algorithms much more. And obviously I will end up in uh, dead cases because uh, obviously the noise will basically um, reduce the speed up in the quantum effects uh, to zero and it basically collapses to um, uh, a, um, a, a classical computation uh, that I have. But the cool thing is actually with uh, Qiskit as well, there, there is a uh, libraries for every quantum algorithm that, uh, you know, that people know and they kind of uh, provide easy libraries. If you want to run Shaw's algorithm to factor prime, uh, to factor any numbers, you just import Shaw's algorithm from uh, Qiskit Aqua, which is, uh, which is a library. You just say, all right, I want to factor this number n equals 15. I use a simulator. I do this uh, 1,000 times and off I run this instance and I get a result. How cool is that that you can run this against uh, against a quantum computer and the only thing you need to do in this example is if you run this against a real quantum computer is to change this backend from the simulator to a different backend and now there's a call out to IBM's uh, quantum computer to run this uh, on, on their backend. It's actually really really cool and this feeling when you run a quantum computing uh, software for the first time is actually it's actually quite cool. So I encourage everybody to look at Qiskit or various quantum computing uh, libraries um, uh, and uh, to play around with this. So the problem obviously is, um, uh, and you guessed it, that in order to do anything meaningful, I need lots of qubits. So in order to use Shaw's algorithm to um, uh, break RSA 2048, I need 4,000 qubits. And I need 4,000 proper qubits, meaning Without any noise, I need for the time of the computation, there can't be any noise on the computation as well. And it's not really a surprise because when Shaw came up with this in 1984, there were no quantum computers. He didn't have to worry about, hey, can I really implement my algorithm or not? He really just came up with a system and method. So, um, it was never really meant to run on a quantum computer. And uh, right now lots of people look at Shaw's algorithm and then say, all right, kind of right now we have 70 qubit, so it's every, the qubit count doubles every year, whatever, so it's gonna be another 10 years be before we have uh, Shaw's algorithm. Nobody's gonna run Shaw's algorithm because it was just a theory. So let's look at some of the, the uh, researches where people took, people took Shaw's algorithm and modified them and optimized them to run on real quantum, uh, quantum hardware. So the first one was Fowler in uh, 2012. Basically, th the first approach was really kind of, I need to tweak this algorithm so it can be, so it can sustain errors. Because Shaw's algorithm really was an assumption, there's no errors, all the qubits are fantastic, uh, no errors. So basically they used what's called the surface codes to allow for errors to occur, and the error rate is 0 0.1 per side of the, uh, of the gate error rate, and um, uh, Fowler came up, I can run Shaw's algorithm 
and I can factor 2048 bit number, but I need 1 billion qubits uh, to do so, which is obviously a massive amount uh in terms of overhead um, uh, to run this. So that was in 2012, not not too long uh, not too long ago. And then in 2017, with further optimizations from O'Gorman, we suddenly kind of like uh, had an uh, had an algorithm where we reduce this 1 billion qubits to just 230 million qubits uh, in 2017. And those are really optimization in the physical connectivity of those qubits. And uh, then Georgiou kind of reduces further to 170 million qubits. So you can see there's algorithmic improvements without any hardware improvements obviously that's happening at the same time as well. But obviously I get down from 1 billion qubits to right now uh, 170 million qubits. And the biggest um, uh, contribution was from Gidney and Akira from uh, um, uh, Google and uh, University in Stockholm where they uh, provided a paper just not long ago earlier this year where they uh, looked into how they could do the same thing what everybody else is doing with just 20 million qubits. Now we went f in 2012 from 1 billion qubits to 2019 to 20 million qubits and we are far from the end of the research there in terms of optimization uh, to this problem. Now I won't go into too much detail of this uh, uh, of what they do but basically they also look into lots of optimization of how things work and they basically also choose similar to Shaw not really look into factoring the numbers directly so they basically convert this factoring problem into short discrete algorithm uh, problem and um, uh, they have a part that is comput computed uh, classically and a part that is computed um, uh, uh, quantumly on a quantum computer and they can show that in order to find P and Q they can uh, come up with obviously they know what N is which is uh, the uh, multiplication of those two they can come up with a number where they know the addition of those numbers are D, so D is known. So if they have two, um, two equations for two variables, which they can fairly easily solve, fairly easily is obviously an overstatement because they still need uh, 20 million uh, qubits uh, to do so. Um, uh, but obviously the, um, the reduction from 1 billion qubits to 20 million qubits is massive. And uh, I expect in the next couple of years there's going to be lots of optimization to Shaw's algorithm and especially to Gidney and the Kera's um, uh, uh, algorithm uh, where this is going to be uh, reduced uh, further on. Obviously 20 million qubits is still a long way away from uh, quantum computers that are accessible today um, uh, where we are in the realm of you know slowly below 100 qubits um, uh, at this point in time. So I want to spend the next, you know, or the last 10 minutes of my presentation on approaching quantum annealing. Those is the second type of quantum computer and uh, that is actually what's quite surprising to me even though everybody's talking about Shaw and the implication of crypt cryptography. Actually quantum annealing right now is much, much further ahead in terms of solving this factorization problem and we're going to look into a little bit how uh, these algorithms work. So as mentioned before quantum annealing, those computers are really computers where it can solve an optimization problem. I need to f I need to define my problem as an optimization problem and then basically quantum annealing computer can take this problem and find the minimum of this uh, problem because it represents a physical state and I know the physical state will always end up in the ground state and uh, I can read then this ground state and I have the solution to my problem. And that's really a cool, a cool theorem um, uh, where you want to find, you want to go into the lowest point, you want to find this lowest point on the right hand side. So how do you end up in this lowest point and not get caught up in those uh, minimas uh, in between and there's lots of ways how you can do this from the, uh, from the physical system. And there's a really cool case on this quantum annealing case where there is a theorem that says if I start in a really, in a very easy quantum mechanical system, in this really easy quantum mechanical system, I know the ground state. So this is my problem I want to solve is here. I am starting here and I really know where I am. I can now slowly evolve and adiabatic means slowly evolving this, the state from this here to the state where I really want to be and now this theorem gives me a guarantee or physical proof that I will end up in the, in the maximum or in the, in the optimal minima of the problem I want to solve. And it's really cool so I have Hamiltonians are functions that define a physical system but basically if you look at the first function, if you put in S equals zero, you end up in this H zero which is my easy 
to understand system where I know the local minima and in my calculations I slowly move s from 0 to 1 and if I'm at 1 I'm in a stage H1 which is the problem that I really want to solve but this uh, adiabatic theorem guarantees to me that I will end up in the maximum uh, minima uh, for the problem that I really want to solve which is really really cool because it gives me I'm, I know I'm not going to be caught into some local minima. But still essentially I want to solve an optimization problem. How do I do this? And the first research came from Burgess in 2002 from uh, Microsoft where you know he provided a foundation of hey I want to solve basically if I want to look into the problem n equals p times q I'm looking for p and q um, uh, so that this uh, equation is true. So I just need to solve this I need to write this as an optimization problem. And basically re re rewrote this as n minus p q squared. And this is a positive function. This is always greater than zero. And this is obviously only zero if n equals pq. And if you write it this way, you have what's called a cubo, a quadratic unconstrained binary um, optimization problem, which you can happily run on any quantum annealer that is out there. And you basically use binary representation, and it's really just a fancy way up here of writing pi and qi are just the i, you know, bit. It's either zero or one. And uh, you basically now uh, write this down, and it's a very simple example. Uh, my example 15 is 5 times 3. Now um, uh, in binary notation, p equals x1, 1, the, the last bit always has to be 1 because the prime number can't be an even number. And I just, you know, n minus pq squared, I just write this through and kind of by hand and see, oh, this is a function I need to minimize now. And I can run this against d waves quantum computer and if I find the minimum I know n equals pq because that's by definition a positive function. So I can use quantum uh, um, d waves quantum computer they provide a library as well and um, uh, you see the link here you can download it. It's basically the same thing I just call factor p. p is my um, uh, product and I can run this on this uh, d waves quantum computer. The problem is if I just use this without any optimization I need uh, n squared qubits for this. So I mean my number of qubits that I need really kind of like grow quite heavily and for larger numbers it is not sustainable um, uh, to do. But I wanted to show you it's all probabilistic so if I run this one time I end up with um, uh, my 415 uh, for the p and q for my two prime numbers is 1 and 7 which is obviously wrong. So I ran this once and I didn't really end up in the uh, in the right spot. But I ran this five times. Now I've already have five and three. It's already 60% um, uh, you know probabilities. And if I ran this 50 times, you know I know my prime numbers are uh, three and five. So I know I need to run those quantum algorithms more and more often to make sure I end up in the same results. Um, I'm going to skip over some of those things because virtually all optimizations of now this base you know of, of Birch's work where he basically looked into hey my multiplication matrix that you write out as a function to be minimized there can be lots of optimizations virtually all of the uh, work that I will present here now is based on optimizations of how you do the multiplications down below here if you've ever done uh, multiplications by hand you know you start on the right and you kind of multiply the lowest numbers and then you have carryovers to the left and virtually all of those optimizations um, uh, go through this uh, how I can do these multiplications much easier. 3D and Agassi did some work in 2016 where they used some of these optimizations to remove some of the order of the degrees. So they were already able to factor a number greater than 200,000 with almost 900 qubits. Now d waves qubits on quantum annealing are not as, don't have to be as good as universal quantum computer qubits. So d wave announced a system with uh, I think around 5,000 qubits for next year. So 900 qubits what was, was what available then, then, uh, back then. On universal quantum computers the biggest prime number is less than 100. And they, these guys in 2016 could already now factor a number that was over 200,000. The big breakthrough was from Zhang at, and, uh, in uh, Indiana uh, in uh, April 2018, and it's really kind of mind blowing. Uh, you see the next one, which was really just uh, two months after, really around optimization of this uh, multiplication map. And they've now raised, they could factor a number which is greater than 350,000 with just 94 qubits. 
Remember, DWF comes up with 5,000 qubit uh, quantum computer uh, next week, uh, ne next year. Um, uh, and it's all based on this optimization uh, problem that we solve for factoring and with the optimization to the multiplication table. And then Peng in 2000, uh, in uh, earlier this year, really, um, uh, and you can see this uh, submission was received in July, while the previous submission was, I think, uh, submitted in April or something, it's just months after optimizes even further and they've been able to factor a number that is right of 1 million with just 90 qubits. So that's already 20 bit number. So right now when we look into the problem of hey can I use a quantum computer to uh, factor prime numbers, universal quantum computers and Shor's algorithms are nowhere compared to uh, quantum annealers. And with quantum annealers I can already um, uh, um, do this with uh, 20 bit, uh, 20 bit numbers. So um, there's uh, three things really interesting. So they, they could run this on already existing hardware today. And all of those algorithms, and that's a really big takeaway um, uh, that you have. To do this, I don't have just one quantum problem that I want to solve. It's always a hybrid model of some classical com computation and some quantum computation. I really use a classical computer, what he's good at, and a quantum computer, what a quantum computer is, uh, uh, um, uh, is good at. So um, my point is, Quantum annealers are a thousand fold better right now than uh, Shor's algorithm on universal quantum computers. But because they are too noisy right now, we are far away from breaking anything that is uh, in use in practical terms. Right now the biggest number is a 20 bit number. But obviously we, uh, we know uh, those two uh, kind of like converging curves here the algorithms are getting better and better. At the same time, the quantum hardware gives me more and more qubits as well. So both of them will actually have a big impact. I can't just rely on my prediction saying, hey, the number of qubits grow by 50% every year, so I'm going to be fine for the next 50 years. You're neglecting the improvements that the algorithms uh, will make over the next, uh, over the next uh, couple of years uh, too. So a couple of uh, myth and reality. Shaw, nobody's going to implement Shaw on any quantum computer whatsoever. Um, uh, Shaw was a theoretical work. There are practical work, um, uh, you know, derivations of this work that will be implemented. Um, at some point, obviously, on the, on the base of Shaw's algorithms, people will break um, uh, the uh, RSA encryption. It is a matter of time. Now we can argue whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, but we're only arguing about the time. We're not arguing, arguing about that it will happen. And obviously there's lots of cases where this is already has an impact right now. If I have bitcoins right now and if my public key is known, I don't care whether it takes me 20 years to uh, get the private key to those, uh, to those bitcoins. Forgetting 20 years, there's you know one and a half million bitcoins from Satoshi flying around which is around 12 billion dollars right now. Hey, if someone comes to me and says, hey Andreas, you know, can you, can you build me a quantum computer? I said, hey, it's really hard, it takes me 12 billion dollars, you know. Hey, here's 12 billion dollars right there. So, um, <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, it takes, it will be quite a while, but I want to provide an overview of the algor algorithms. I started this talk talking about, hey, just the asymmetric world of the RSA world, but there's plenty of work, and this is uh, kind of, you know, from this Chinese paper in the ver very end, that's the, that's the, uh, the end statement. There's plenty of work underway right now to use quantum annealers, also to look into symmetric uh, encryption. So if you say, hey, I just use symmetric encryption, I'm fine, that may not be holding up for too long and I thank you very much. I'm out of time. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? We, we don't have time for questions. You can find me anywhere if you have some questions. Happy to engage with you. Thanks very much. <laughs>